Okay, I was asked to uh, make a little video about parental linkages, so in order to explain this, um, again in a video, I decided to use an example that we went over in class. Now there's more questions to this example, so I'll just go through all of them just in case that might be helpful to you too. So in this question, just to refresh your memory, you have two parents, parent number one, parent number two, that were crossed, and these are their offspring. So that you're given a set of data. Now, you should notice that the two parents, their genotypes, they've been set up so that this is actually a cross for linkage. When you're trying to determine or do linkage analysis between two different genes, you want to cross a parent who is heterozygous for those genes, so in this case it's a dihybrid, with a parent who is homozygous recessive for both of those genes. And they conveniently did that for you, so that allows us to do this type of analysis. So question A, what gametes were produced by parent 1 and in what proportions? So parent 1 is the dihybrid or the double heterozygote. So to determine what gametes parent 1 made, you can look at your offspring, especially since they give you the genotype of your offspring that are seen. But let's just say hypothetically, well, if we look at parent 1, if we were to do a Punnett square, we would try to figure out what are the possible gametes that parent 1 could make. Parent 1 could make this gamete, right? Could make that kind of sperm or, or eggs. This, this combination or this combination. Whoops. There we go. So parent 1 could make all four of those possible combinations. But do we actually see those in the offspring? Do the offspring actually demonstrate that parent one made those? So if we look at the offspring, they gave us the genotype, so we can actually determine this. It's easy to determine by just getting rid of what parent number two made. So parent number two, all parent number two could give is a little a and a little b. That's it. So let's get rid of that in the genotypes. So that probably came from parent 2, and this came from parent 2. Parent 2, parent 2, parent 2, parent 2, parent 2. There you go. And look, it reveals to you what parent 1 had to give. So if I look at what's left, I definitely see all four possible gametes represented from parent 1 there. Now the question also asks, so all of these are correct. The question also asks, in what proportions do you see them? Well, this one, 38 offspring got that gamete from parent one. They had to have gotten those alleles from parent one because the other ones came from parent two. So the proportion of individuals who got it, in order to figure that out, you would take 38 and divide it by the total offspring. So if you add up all of those offspring, you're gonna get 100. So that means 38% of them, 38% of the offspring, are, got that combination from parent one. Or in other words, parent one made that combo, a plus, a, the wild type allele combos, 38% of the time, because 38 individuals got it. So he made it 38% of the time. Okay, so we keep it the same logic for wild type A, mutant B, that's going to be this one here. So 12 individuals out of 100 got it, so that means he made that, or parent one made that combination 12% of the time. For the third one, that's going to be the last one, so that's over here. Um, 13 out of 100, so parent one made that combination 13% of the time. And then for the double mutant, uh, only 37 individuals showed that parent one gave those combo that combo to them so that means parent one made that combination 37 percent of the time so those are your proportions so let's move on to question B do these proportions suggest linkage well no linkage means that parent one should have made each of those combinations in equal amounts so 25 percent of the time you should have made that one 25 percent of the time you should have made that combo and so on to total your to give you the total 100%. But we can see here that each one was not made in equal proportions. Thus, 
we would say yes, these are link. It suggests linkage anyway. All right, so let's move on to part C. Demonstrate the arrangement of the genes on the chromosomes in parent one using the appropriate symbols. So in other words, we have to draw out what the parental linkages are for parent one. To answer question part C, we need to look at the data again. So they're asking what, demonstrate the arrangement of the genes, so A and B, how A and B are arranged on the chromosome in parent number one. So again, what that's basically asking you is what are the parental linkages for genes A and B. We can ignore parent two because parent two, it's going to be this no matter what because they're all recessive. So parent two is boring. We want to know parent one. Okay. So in order to understand what they're asking for is this. I'm going to redraw it here. Parent one has homologous chromosomes. Right? Everybody has a pair of homologous chromosomes. And parent one is heterozygous, which means parent one has one of these and parent one has one of these, right? It's heterozygous for the A gene. And we've already determined that A and B must be linked, probably, so I'm going to write the B gene on here. But my the issue here, what's being questioned, is is A, the wild-type version of A, linked to the wild-type version of B? Or instead, is it linked to the mutant version of B in parent number one. So is it that linkage? That's one option. Or is it this linkage? How were they originally in parent number one? This is in what arrangement are they? And because we don't always like to draw the chromosomes out like that, this is what we usually do. We draw the lines to represent your homologous chromosomes and we're saying is it like this? That parent one is heterozygous, that those are his two homologous chromosomes, or is the arrangement like this? So which one is it? Is it option A or option B? Well, we look at the data. So if we look at the data, there are unequal amounts of every combination that the parent one gave to his offspring. And if we look, these two were seen more often in the offspring, which means parent gave this combo and this combo more often to his offspring than he gave the other two combinations which suggests that that is how the two genes are linked. The wild types are linked together on the same homologous chromosome in parent one, and the homozygous recessives are linked together on the, same, on the other homologous chromosome in parent number one. It looks like this. Yes, either way, parent one would be heterozygous, but we want to know, the question is asking, how are they arranged on the chromosomes? So the data will tell us how they were arranged. He had the two wild types linked together and the two mutants linked together on the homologous chromosomes. So the data suggests that that's how they were linked. And so now if this is the case, if they were linked like that, then the other two combinations that you happen to see, so these guys right here, you might think, well, how were those possible? Well, these were made possible, those two were made possible if crossing over happened between them. So those combinations represent your crossover um, events. So parent one was able to make the other combinations because crossing over happened, but you can see it's more rare compared to just giving his offspring what his linkages were already, the way they were already uh, arranged. So now we can address question E or D, I guess it should be. <laughs> um, now that we know who the parentals, what were the original parental linkages and who are the crossovers. So if they are linked, which we suggested that they were already, 
indicate the genetic map distance between, between genes A and B. So since we already know that these guys are linked, and we already know how they're linked, right? what's the distance between them? What's the genetic map distance between them? And the way we determine that is we utilize what we already know, which is that there is a correlation or a relationship between the genetic distance between two genes and how often crossing over happens between them. If there's a lot of crossing over, that means they're very far away from each other. If there's not a lot of crossing over, the genes are closer together. So we use the frequency of crossovers to estimate the distance between them. So what you do is you add up the total number of crossover events, so that means how many offspring display the uh, combination of alleles from parent one that suggested those were crossovers, so that's, that's these guys, these were the crossover combos from parent one. So there were a total of 25 out of 100 offspring that showed parent one had a crossover event. So that actually, that percentage, which is, comes out to 25%, that's your recombination or crossover frequency. That is going to equal 25 um, map units. That is just equal. 25% means 25 map units, or that's, that's the measure of genetic distance. So we would say A and B are 25 map units away from each other. So 1% recombination frequency, which is what we calculated here, what's the recombination frequency, is equal to 1 map unit. Oops. 1 genetic map unit. Alternatively, instead of using map units, sometimes people use centimorgans. So they're all the same thing. Okay, so if it's 25% recombination, that means they're 25 map units apart. So now we answered all the questions.